Autophagy makes growth sustainable. We still want growth. We don't want to get in a mindset where all we focus on is autophagy. In fact, the journal Cell Science published a paper that put it great. They said that autophagy is the yin and yang. Okay, so you're providing this yin to the yang of growth. Okay, now envision it like this. I don't care where you stand on any political spectrum, we can all agree that having a garbage patch in the ocean is not a good thing, right? We have a huge patch of garbage twice the size of Texas in the ocean. That's a problem either way. As a result of our growth as a society over the last 70, 80 years, right? Okay, now think of that garbage patch being in your body. When we have growth that is out of control, we have a lot of waste. We have a lot of proteins that aggregate, okay? So that garbage patch is like proteins in our body. Now, autophagy is here to manage and make the growth sustainable. So we can still grow because we want muscle, we want growth, we want DNA, we want everything to grow and flourish, but it needs to be managed. That's the main key here. Autophagy manages that. So we're gonna break down the various forms of autophagy, how they work, and then we're also gonna talk about how you can induce autophagy in different ways once you have a fundamental understanding. Let's jump in. Now after today's video, I put a link down below for Seed Daily Symbiotic. If you're trying to change your diet up, I would recommend you add a good quality probiotic or at least some good fermented foods in if you don't go that route but seed is a unique probiotic because it has a prebiotic and a probiotic in one capsule. So you see there's two sort of capsules in one. So it breaks down in different areas of your gut. So you have a better likelihood of proper colonization of the bacteria in the lower part of the intestinal tract where you want the bacteria to colonize. So seed is super unique with how they're built, but also it's the only probiotic that I personally would recommend. I think most probiotics are garbage because they all break down in the hostile gut. So seed is unique and I definitely recommend you check them out. And that is a 25% off discount link for people that watch this channel. So again, 25% off in the top line of the description underneath this video. Now inside our cell, we have what is called a lysosome. Now a lysosome is almost like a little bit of a recycling center in and of itself. It does a number of different things, but there are different types of autophagy that occur inside the lysosome. For example, there's microphagy. Now microphagy is a much smaller scale that is actually occurring in the lysosome. That's complicated stuff, let's not really worry about that right now, plus there's not as much research there as there is in the other ones. Then there is what is called chaperone autophagy or chaperone-induced autophagy. We talk about this in my sauna videos a lot. When you create stress, like heat stress, you have what are called chaperoning proteins that come along and they say, hey, hey, dysfunctional protein, I'm gonna grab you and I'm gonna bring you with me and we're gonna go to the lysosome together and you're gonna get degraded there. So they are chaperoned, okay? We're not focusing too much on those today too because they're very complicated and I would need four hours to explain the embryonic nature of them. But I will tell you, a sauna will upregulate these. And then the big one that we know a fair bit about is called macro autophagy. And this is the large scale autophagy. And in a nutshell, here's what happens with macro autophagy. When there are bunches of proteins that are aggregated or dysfunctional, what happens is something called an autophagosome comes in and engulfs the protein. So there is a specific thing called an autophagosome. Comes in, it grabs the protein and it engulfs it and it brings it back to the lysosome and then it turns into something called an autolysosome. So to paint sort of an analogy picture here, it's like this barge that goes out to the ocean, grabs a bunch of the plastic from the plastic mess out there, brings it back to the mainland, and then deals with it there. That's essentially what's happening in macroautophagy. Now we used to think that macroautophagy was non-selective, meaning when autophagy turned on, it just occurred at all different cellular levels, at all different mitochondrial levels, whatever. And that made a lot of sense up until relatively recently and we start to understand that it is actually selective, meaning depending on where the stressor is, depending on where the nutrient scarcity is, depending on where the exercise is, whatever, it can actually stimulate autophagy to occur in different places. Let me give you some examples of what this looks like. An example would be like, we only have maternal DNA in our mitochondria. Okay, so as adults, we have maternal DNA in our mitochondria. Now, when we are first fertilized, we actually have paternal and maternal DNA or mitochondria, right? Now, as we get older, 
that paternal DNA or that paternal mitochondria goes through its own autophagy. It's called allophagy, actually. So an interesting name that it has itself. And that's just like a predetermined way that we go through autophagy before we even are aware of it, right? Now, another one that we have to look at is one that's called agrophagy. And this is when proteins aggregate. So classic example, proteins that are dysfunctional clump together. Now, when you look in the world of Alzheimer's disease, there is something called amyloid plaque. Now, I do understand that in relatively recent news, the whole amyloid plaque piece has come under a lot of investigation, but it still stands that it exists. So amyloid plaque is aggregated proteins that essentially can affect the brain. And aggregated proteins can affect many different things. So what happens with agrophagy is it breaks down these protein aggregations specifically and allows those to be recycled or ultimately dealt with in whatever fashion. Then the next one is probably my most interesting one and it's one that I'm fascinated by and it's relatively new in terms of how it's been discovered. It's called lipophagy. So we used to think that autophagy only occurred in misfolded proteins or just in proteins in general. Now we see that autophagy occurs at the fat level too. Lipo means fat, lipophagy means essentially fat recycling. So in the case of nutrient scarcity specifically, like if you're starving, you're not eating, or you're just severe caloric restriction, your body will actually break down fats into more usable forms independent of ways like hormone sensitive lipase, independent of the typical catalysts for fat burning or fat oxidation or fat mobilization for that matter. Lipophagy breaks down these fats into usable forms to balance energy homeostasis. So autophagy in essence, as a master term, helps create more fat to be used as fuel. This is why it's so beneficial with fasting because not only is it providing us with efficiency, but it's providing us with an additional fuel. It might literally help us burn more fat. In fact, there are some interesting studies that show that when you impair lipophagy, like if you stop or halt lipophagy, excess fat accumulates in places like the liver, fatty liver disease, things like that. Quite interesting. Now, there's other forms too, like there's uh, ribophagy. Ribophagy is the recycling of ribosomes. Okay, we have this occurring, just rattling off a few. Then there's pexophagy, which essentially breaks down peroxisomes. Then there's reticulophagy. Now, reticulophagy is going to help break down the endoplasmic reticulum and recycle parts of that. Now, the endoplasmic reticulum is an area of a cell that helps provide and build proteins that that cell needs. Very critical piece to make sure that it's clear and functioning well because if the endoplasmic reticulum is damaged, a cell becomes severely damaged. Then one that we've talked about before, mitophagy. Mitophagy is the mitochondrial autophagy. What's interesting is that mitochondria can regenerate through fusion and fission as a natural part of their DNA process, as a natural part of what a mitochondria can do. So separate and apart from that, you have mitophagy. Now mitophagy helps clear up wasted space so that you can create more mitochondria. So fusion and fission creates more mitochondrial density, okay? Natural process there when you exercise, things like that, more fusion and fission. But mitophagy clears out the wasted space so that the fusion and fission can create healthy mitochondria in that space that was once occupied by crappy mitochondria. Now let's get into what you really want. How the heck do we induce autophagy? Well, there's a few different ways and they do it in different avenues. One of the first ones, if you're a veteran of this channel, you know I'm a big fan of intermittent fasting or fasting even in a prolonged sense intermittently. Now, fasting is interesting because it tackles autophagy in three beneficial ways. For one, fasting is going to make us more efficient. Okay, so it says, okay, there's not a lot of fuel. We need to downgrade how many cells we have and we need to become really efficient. So let's get rid of the waste and become efficient. That is a good process in and of itself. Now we have lipophagy. Lipophagy means that, like I said before, we're breaking down fats. So it's actually helping us with fat burning and getting rid of potentially toxic lipids that aren't doing a good thing in our body. But then thirdly, one of the byproducts of autophagy in the first place is an amino acid called alanine. So alanine is unique because alanine then goes to the liver and drives gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis is the creation of glucose from other substrates. So we get a three triple whammy effect from fasting as far as the benefits of autophagy are concerned. Okay, the next one, and arguably the most important, is going to be exercise. Okay, now exercise, of course, we know is hugely beneficial. There was a relatively recent study that took a look at rodent models, and that demonstrated that 
fed state exercise versus fasted state exercise both induced autophagy. But fasted state increased LC3B2, which is an autophagic marker, quite a bit more, which implies that perhaps being in a fasted state could induce autophagy more, which could make sense because fasting induces autophagy and exercise induces autophagy, so maybe overlapping them gets you a double whammy effect. Now here's a quick clip of a video that I did with Dr. Tommy Wood where he explains that exercising can get you basically the effect of a three-day fast. Okay, so very interesting section there. But when you look at the applied literature in humans, a 60 minute bout of low level intensity aerobic exercise, like 50 to 60% of VO2 max, upregulates autophagy as much as a 72 hour fast. Then there was another study that showed that eight weeks of resistance training increased autophagy throughout, not just during exercise. So with aerobic exercise, the autophagy seems to increase during exercise even when you're intermittently fed throughout that workout. So if you're feeding yourself small amounts of glucose during a workout, the autophagy response from a workout is so strong that it's going to supersede any benefit or any negative attribute towards autophagy from the food. So very interesting. They also noticed that as autophagy went up in LRP3 inflammasome, inflammatory proteins went down, which is very interesting. Another interesting piece is the presence of beta-hydroxybutyrate. So whether you're doing this through exogenous ketone use or an intermittent ketogenic diet, very interesting. So beta-hydroxybutyrate is a ketone. And what we're seeing now with the presence of beta-hydroxybutyrate is that that presence alone induces autophagy independent of nutrient scarcity. So even if you're not in a deficit, the presence of ketones seem to increase autophagy. Now what's interesting is if you start looking at the research, there's some increases in autophagic markers in the brain, and that could be one of the powerful links between ketones and epilepsy. One of the things that we know as at least a somewhat medical fact, or accepted as medical fact, is that ketones are good for epilepsy. Ketogenic diet is good for epilepsy. Is it the absence of carbohydrates or is it the presence of ketones doing the work? Is the presence of ketones providing the brain a fuel, or are the presence of ketones actually increasing autophagy, which is increasing a certain activity or decreasing a certain activity in the brain linked with epilepsy? It's a very, very interesting conundrum trying to figure that out. So at the end of the day, the best things that you can do to induce autophagy, aerobic exercise, 30 minutes, four days per week. Okay, that's at like 50 to 70% max heart rate. Good intensity, okay? Resistance training for five sets of five exercises three times per week, okay? If you can do that, you can be in a really good spot, right? So find an exercise that you like, do five sets of it for each body part, and do that throughout the course of the week, just two or three times. Okay, next up, saunas, because that's gonna induce autophagy via the heat shock protein pathway, which we didn't talk too much about today, but 20 minutes in a sauna, two to three days per week, can be very effective. Okay, fasting. Okay, doing some form of fasting, doing at least like a 20 or a 24 hour fast once every month really will help you out a lot. But if you're intermittent fasting, I would recommend doing like an 18 hour fast twice a week just to allow your body to recycle a little bit. And then occasionally do some glycogen depletion stuff where you go maybe five, six days with very low carbs so that you start producing ketones and get an effect there. Or if you want to go all the way, you could do a ketogenic diet for a couple of months and kind of induce it that way. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.